And our last and final think tank, think tank number 10, will be June 12th. So we're going to skip next week due to some scheduling conflicts, but we will be back June 12th, and it's going to be a very exciting lineup of Amanda Mooborn and Tarun. So they will be talking about lessons learned, opportunities, and really the look ahead post-COVID. So it's going to be a really exciting conversation. Join us, not next week, two weeks. Like I said, this is the eighth, ninth installment. So we have all the other recordings on here. We'll send out this slide deck. So you guys can have the email addresses of the speakers if you want to get in contact with them. If we talk about something that's happened in a previous think tank, please go back and look through that. And we will we will be recording and we'll send it out along with the slide deck on Monday. Ooh, lots of plugs and announcements. So um, getting to our speakers today, I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but today we'll have Jessica and Thomas. And since we only have two speakers today, uh, at the end, I was asked, Aaron and I were asked a couple of discussion questions this week, and we thought they would be really beneficial to open it up to the group and ask you guys. So if you aren't interested um, in the discussion points or get ready to talk, please, we'd really appreciate some talking towards the end. So get ready to turn off those mics. Like I said, we want this to be as discussion oriented as possible. So you can do that in the chat. You can unmute yourself or you can raise your hand, jump in at any time. Um, we're looking forward to it. So with that, I'm going to pass the screen off to Jessica or she can take it away from me. Thank you, Allie. Let's see if I can share my screen. Yeah, I just made you presenter. Okay, awesome. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, so my name is so thank you, Allie, and thank you everyone for having us. My name is Jessica Van Dyne, and I'm gonna be presenting with my colleague and friend, Adam Furnier, and we're from CCHMC, um, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So today we're really just gonna be talking about this pharmacy mail order delivery project we had the pleasure of being part of during COVID-19. And so when we got uh, asked to have, be part of this project, it was really an advantage, had an advantage because We'd already been working with the pharmacy on another project. So we had really good working relationships with everyone on the team. And we really had an in-depth in knowledge of the process. And so to give everyone just a quick scope, we are only talking about our outpatient pharmacy, so not our inpatient pharmacy. And then we're also talking more particularly about refill medications to start. And that's here at Cincinnati Children's and that when was now. It was fast, it was furious. When we got asked to join this project, they almost wanted it today, you know, maybe even yesterday if we could have done that. Um, and the whole point of this was to keep our family safe and decrease foot traffic into the hospital. At Cincinnati Children's, our outpatient pharmacy is inside of the hospital, so you can't like drive around and pick it up. So every time a family would come up and pick up a refill medication, they'd have to park their car, go through the elevator, go through the screening process, get their temperature done, and then kind of wait in queue before they could even get their medication. So our pharmacy leadership said, hey, if we can mail them, we should. So, so uh, this project was about two months ago. On Tuesday, March 31st, late afternoon, Adam and I kind of got the tap on the shoulder saying that outpatient pharmacy was requesting some QI support to mail out their process or mail out their uh, medications. And within 24 hours, we were process mapping. We had a full detailed flow of what was current state and how to build in these intentional redundancies to make sure that we were, you know, getting paid and we were also sending people the prescription to their most current address. And then within 48 hours, we were physically in the outpatient pharmacy. We were laying blue tape everywhere, 5S 
everywhere. Um, we were building these workstations and we actually mailed our first two prescriptions. And then the next day, so 72 hours from when we originally got the ask, we were training our OTPT volunteers on this new process that we were all building together. And we mailed out our first 28 prescriptions. So this was fast and furious. It was fun. It was exciting. And we were all really just flexible and learning together through a method through using a methodological approach. So looking at this process map, I don't expect anyone to be able to read it. This is really just to show the complexity of everything that was going on within the actual pharmacy before it ever got into the shipping station. And so there's about 11 decision points and 19 separate steps. So it was fairly complex. And on the right, you'll see these red, blue, and green. And that was to say, if we were mailing a prescription, was it hazardous? Was it, was it refrigerated or was it standard? And then these clouds, when we built this, it, they meant we didn't really know how this was gonna happen. We didn't know what it, it tangibly looked like to mail a hazardous medication or a refrigerated medication. So this just all speaks to how uh, fluid and fast all of this was. And I'm gonna go ahead and let Adam talk more about the actual mailing and packaging process. Thank y'all. So thanks, Jess. Uh, this is Adam Furnier. Again, I'm a uh, quality improvement specialist at the hospital. Uh, so this is a, another really uh, cumbersome looking flow that we put together for the mailroom process. At first, uh, this team, they do roughly 250 prescriptions a day. That's a high day for them. So there's not a ton of volume there. So a lot of the, what they were mailing out prior to this was like maybe one or two prescriptions a day at the, at the most uh, that we would see. So uh, we, we tabulate this into two different uh, separate flows, one for refrigerated items and uh, one uh, flow specifically for a standard or a hazardous item. And, and the only difference between a, a hazardous item would be like a controlled substance, like uh, Jess was saying, or if it was um, uh, if it was a liquid that if it spilled, it could uh, you know it could cause harm to uh, a person that's uh, that's touching it. So uh, those are those are packaged a little bit differently. But basically, the flow uh, was pretty um, it it was pretty complex for a simple process. If that makes sense. Uh, There's a lot of intentional redundancies that we built in. There was a lot of things that we wanted to make sure because we were working in, in a pretty small area. If you look at the area that we were that we were really working on, if you if you can imagine this, it was it's about the size of a, uh, I'd say a large living room that they fill prescriptions in. And then uh, it go, we, we, you know, we had to uh, do the delivery piece outside of where they were working. So they didn't have a ton of room in one area and we had to move this to another area in order for it to package out. So if you look at the, the next screen, this will give you a good idea of kind of what we were working with from a mail room perspective. Uh, go ahead, Jess. So this is, a, we joke about this, but literally this is Carol's desk. So Carol is a, an admin uh, administrator, executive administrator for the, for the uh, pharmacy department. And uh, she was working from home. She's, a, um, she's close to retirement and didn't want to come back for a while. So she just kind of said, I'm going to work from home for a while. So uh, her fault for leaving and our uh, benefit for stealing her, her area. And it was, a, it was the closest area that we could work with and a large space that we could work with uh, in, in order to get these things done. Again, we weren't looking at a ton of volume, uh, but we really wanted to make sure that uh, first and foremost, that we were, had safety in mind. Uh, safety in mind was the, the biggest key. We wanted to make sure, you can see a picture of two, kind of hard to see, but there's two people at the bottom of the, uh, uh, at the, bottom of the screen slide here. Uh, that uh, that are working. They're they're six feet apart. Uh, they are, are both wearing masks. They're both uh, gloved up. They have uh, hand sanitizers. They have all the things that they need in order to remain germ free as possible and uh, to keep safe social distancing in that area. So it's big enough that we can uh, safely social distance play, uh, people. And then we also want to use like an old kind of manufacturing uh, methodology for how we were processing. We wanted everything to come in one area. Uh, have everything ergonomically set up for the people so that they could work uh, and, and not have to bend over or do too much motion. So everything had to be kind of either they could they could read it and, and work in a comfortable uh, setting. Uh, everything went in one area and everything that was going out and finished package was going out in another area so that we didn't have this cross contamination of, of stuff coming in and stuff going out. Uh, you can see some of the bins that we had on the table. Everything was labeled. 
uh, everything had a spot and everything was in that spot so you can see all their tools. We also had a number of uh, uh, lo local bins underneath of those tables and, and we kind of, again, commandeered her desk so she had some shelves above that we put uh, some of the working materials they need, packaging materials, bubble wrap, tape, et cetera. Uh, uh, we had two bins there, as you see on the, uh, the working table, one blue one was for uh, items that need to be refrigerated and the red one was for everything else. Uh, so when uh, when the pharmacist was done, they would they would deliver product about every hour. Uh, so in order to allow them time to package things out, uh, they, they made sure that uh, they would just go out on an hourly basis. Uh, so then we also, the people that we were using were, were from different uh, divisions. So the two that you see down there are, um, one of them is a physical therapist, and the other one is an occupational therapist. So they were on furlough and uh, we needed some people to package out some product and uh, it was a good opportunity to get them back to work. So we brought them into the hospital. They worked with us for a week. And then the following week, we had two new employees. So training and making sure people were up to speed uh, was prominent. So if you look, go to the next slide, Jess. Uh, we built out this uh, a training within the industry, um, a job aid uh, and, and job instruction for, for each person. So you can see in this process that we put this uh, put together, you have the work sequence, the, the what are we doing here, uh, the uh, how are we doing it, and then under the key point, and the reason for the key point was the why. Uh, so we built that out for each step of this process with illustrations uh, at the uh, uh, also and pictures that we could actually show them physically. And then this allowed us to, to get people up to speed relatively quickly. Uh, we can go in and uh, train someone pretty fast, show them kind of, hey, here's, uh, we're gonna clean our hands uh, with hand sanitizer, we're gonna put on rubber gloves, uh, when our hands are dry, and this is why we're doing it, and this is what we're going to use, and here's where this should be, here's how it's labeled. So we spent a lot of time doing that as well in order to make sure that we could train people pretty much on the fly. And then uh, our last slide, uh, just kind of a, a good visual to, to show why this thing was so successful. Uh, we, we ramped up pretty fast. I mean, they, they told us, uh, like Jess said, uh, they, we had a tap on a Tuesday and we were shipping out product on a Friday and uh, training people on a Monday and then training people on a Monday. <laughs> so it was, it was fast and furious. But the one thing that we saw was when, when all parties are lying together, things move a lot swift, uh, swifter than you would if they weren't. Uh, we had, um, you know, it was one goal in mind, and that was really the safety of our employees, the safety of our patients. And, uh, and part of that was we don't want a lot of unnecessary traffic coming through the hospital. And the other thing was this, is, this should have been done a long time ago. Our hospital, we should have been mailing uh, 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 refilled medications out for some time now, especially in the outpatient setting. Uh, we lose a lot of volume to Walgreens, to CVS, to, uh, you know, Walmart or whoever uh, anybody else would rather get their prescriptions from because we don't have this process in place. Where we're located, it's very difficult to drive downtown, find a parking spot. Parking is a, at a premium at the Cincinnati Children's and then come in, get your medications, go back out. It's just a mess. So it's better for us if we can if we can provide that service for our customers. And when, when our parties were aligned together, it made a big difference of getting this thing moving really fast. Uh, we're constantly learning and evolving. Uh, you know, we had this uh, uh, on that picture, we had a, a piece of paper up on the wall and we just said every single day at the end of the day, what worked, what worked, what went wrong? And if something didn't work, uh, you know, we had, uh, we had two new trainees come in that following Monday and they, they had a better process for how they were packaging out product in order to be able to check at each step of the process. You know, we were we were kind of doing a, a, a one piece flow, but one piece going to one person and one piece going to the other. And then afterwards, uh, we, after getting some feedback and getting some information from the, from the team, we said, you know what, we can, uh, you know, if we do certain steps and we do, and the other person does the other steps, it allows us to have a, a little bit more consistency with our process. So we were constantly learning and evolving and we were doing it on the fly, which was really uh, interesting to see. And then finally, uh, you know, the next steps would be, we, we do a lot of uh, reconciliation, but it's all manual. You know, it's like somebody going in, we have stickers and we put stickers on the, the prescription and we take that sticker off, we put it on a piece of paper and then we do some validation and make sure that we got everything packed out. But there's still that human element that could be a problem. So 
our next step would be to really, we want to automate this. We've got a, uh, a new system that they're putting in place at the hospital that allows us to do some barcode scanning. And I think that uh, barcode scanning and uh, the delivery options, so we can have a very valid check when that thing leaves, when it arrives, and then when it leaves again. Uh, so that's our biggest thing, because we don't want, the worst thing that could happen is our patients don't get their medication for some reason, or we send them the wrong thing, which could be detrimental to the patient. So we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing and, and putting pokey oaks and, re and better reconciliation processes in place is what's going to allow us to do that. So overall, I think this was a really good project. Jess was awesome, and and and, and uh, you know we were we were both really uh, energized in getting this this work done. And uh, it's been uh, it's been one of the highlights of what I've done here at the hospital in the five years I've been there, uh, just because it was so quick, and it was uh, it was a lot of fun doing it. We had a lot of engaged uh, people moving forward in this. So with that, I'll that's pretty much it, and I'll, I'll leave it open for questions for Jess and I and. Uh, Awesome, thank you. Uh, hey, so this is Aaron. I was just gonna say uh, there was a question from Robert Hall in the uh, chat. If you can, uh, he said, how did you decide to do a mail order process rather than using a courier or another delivery method? So I think that the main, uh, uh, the main thing with this was there wasn't a ton of volume. So uh, we, we had talked about doing uh, maybe using, utilizing UPS or using FedEx, but the other the, the question we might have is we, uh, we might not have a consistent pickup and it was pretty expensive. Uh, even, even with this process, I think we were taping $8 to every box that we were sending out. <laughs> it was, it's $8 to ship these things out and that's just on an average package. So we didn't plan on making this a profitable piece at first until we can start doing some of the uh, more consistently and higher volume of the refills. But, uh, but basically we were just, uh, you know, they already had a mail pa uh, pickup in place. So that was really kind of the, the impetus of doing that uh, that way. And Jess, you can go on mute. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, we are also in between uh, systems in outpatient pharmacy. So the rest of the ho hospital all uses Epic and inpatient pharmacy also uses Epic, but we were using QS1. And so we just got Epic a few weeks ago, Epic Willow amb Ambulatory, and that has more shipping features in it. So they kind of wanted to wait to build out a more permanent um, process before until we were in Epic Willow. Awesome, thanks guys. Uh, I did have a question. How are you guys planning on next steps after COVID? Are you thinking about ways you can make this cheaper and maybe use a courier or what, what are the next steps? Well, I think the next steps are we need to get out of Carol's desk. <laughs> that's going to be that's going to be odd. I, I've been staying away purposefully because I, I I know her, and if she finds me and finds that I've ruined her desk, she's going to kill me. So we're going to get out of Carol's desk, and we purposefully build it the way we build it so that it can be picked up and placed in just about anywhere. So once we do have a, you know, we're we're kind of landlocked in the spot that we're at right now. Uh, so the, the 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 fulfillment piece is going to have to be in a different area for sure. Uh, and uh, so that'll be our first challenge will, will be to pick this up and put it in some uh, another area. And then I think if uh, we could start getting uh, and we, we've been collecting data, so we know what they're what, what consistently they're filling on a regular basis. And then we'll just start using more of a courier system from there, I believe, because uh, the mail, um, while it's 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 great, uh, the, the pickups are usually it's like one a day. So there's not a whole lot of stuff that we can set up with and we can do some additional stuff. But I don't. I don't think it would be uh, as value added as if we went to someone else. Great. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Who covers the mail costs? Are you charging customers, or is the hospital eating it? Hospital eats it. Yeah, we're eating it. Yeah. But right now we are, um, and we don't. And we don't ever plan on pay, uh, passing that to the to our patients. Uh, so. 
the hope is that, that the volume uh, increase will offset that and it'll just be more of a service. Um, we don't, again, we don't do enough volume to where it's going to kill us, but uh, we definitely don't want a ton of cost um, associated with it. Awesome. Uh, unless there are any more questions, we will pass it over to Tom. Thank you guys so much. This was really Thank you. This is Tom just making sure my audio is coming through and getting ready to share my screen. Yep, we hear you. Great. Well, thank you for inviting me. I did, and also thank you for sharing the previous Think Tank presentations. I've seen a lot through those conversations, a lot of great improvement activity that's occurring within your all's organizations. And the innovation that's happening, the improvement that's happening. I don't think we allow it to rest after COVID-19 and the risk of it have settled. So in my presentation, I wanna talk about going forward from here. I, I think a lot of people, there are things uh, that we wanna bring with us into the future state. And then there are some things that we wanna leave behind us as we go forward. So as I scour social media and I talk to organizations, um, sometimes you'll hear people say, I can't just wait to get back to normal there's varying degrees on whether or not that's gonna happen. So in some ways, looking down the road, thinking about what's coming next and uh, continuing to drive momentum in that way will set your organization up for success. So in my presentation, the objective is to provide you for an overview of a framework that allows you to drive continuous improvement and to make it a team sport. So as a result of COVID, everyone had a similar challenge. Everyone was facing um you know this this need this urgency to respond and innovate and focus on safety and keep their services operational so it was all hands on deck i don't think i've seen healthcare ever operate all hands on deck before and with this challenge we're facing everyone's coming forward with ideas and spending time and energy to innovate and take the organization forward and i'd hate to see organizations stop that after the risk of COVID-19 is behind us. So I wanna talk about how do we keep this momentum going? A little bit about me, before I started my own business, I consulted in the Midwest here, of Indianapolis, a regional health system. And what I specialized in was supporting organizations and hospital turnaround. So whenever things were in dire straits, I was the individual that they sent in. So oftentimes uh, I was being asked to close multi-million dollar financial gaps um, restructure leadership, form a portfolio of work, train the workforce and activate and coordinate multiple projects to help the organization um, stabilize and then move forward. So a lot of my experience has been uh, portfolio management and plane air traffic control. So in that experience, uh, I realized that there was a niche for it and I started my own business, going out to organizations, helping them do those things. And it's really not about the finance um, or the outcomes as much as it is about the culture. So for me, one of those things I'm very passionate about is helping individuals find themselves in a position to where they feel like they're doing very purposeful work, that they are invited, they have the safety to bring their ideas forward and that they can be uh, an individual who at the end of the day goes home fulfilled knowing that they contributed to something purposeful. So with COVID-19, a lot changed immediately and frequently and reminded me of a quote that was really something that helped me when I went from working in an organization to working for myself, was there was a lot of things I needed to unlearn in order to create the space to learn new things. So Rich Rohr says very wisely that transformation is often more about unlearning than it is learning. So almost ever overnight, the things that worked for us stopped and we had to pivot and make decisions about how we were going to do things differently. And you know, we had a need that we had to respond to very quickly. So there was motivation there. But thereafter, how do we 
continue to encourage people to unlearn old habits and innovate and take healthcare to the next level. I think that's an interesting challenge. So in a state of VUCA, uh, VUCA sorry, even with COVID-19, before COVID-19, healthcare was in the state of VUCA. There was a lot of rapid change, complexity, and uncertainty occurring within healthcare uh, even before COVID-19 happens. But to, to be successful in an environment as such, it's really important that leadership is present and visible and active and adaptive. And not, not just, you know, the individuals who don the title of I'm a leader, maybe in the position that they hold, but everyone in the organization needs to realize that they are a leader in some way. And that the way that they act and behave is important to weathering the storm. So if individuals are fearful and acting based on scarcity and short-sighted, those things may help you in a short window of time. But you have to realize after COVID-19, we're still going to have to improve healthcare. So we can't be so short-sighted that we don't come out in a way to which we can take any logical steps forward because you know, we exhausted our resources, we caused a lot of burnout, we changed processes in a way to which they won't work for us going forward. So you wanna balance this short-term adapting to long, with long-term thinking. And I think that ability to step back and see the big picture is something that is hard. It's easier to say than, than it is to actually do. Because when you're in chaos and there's a lot of uncertainty, you're simply reacting. You're swept up by all the sense of urgency. And I think you have to stay grounded in, in those situations. And having a process that is reliable and allows you to facilitate information sharing decision making and coordinating resources is critical in, in, in any situation, especially in a pandemic. So if your organization didn't have systems and structures to share information, to facilitate decision making, coordinate resources or execute projects, you know, you were on shaky ground. And I think if anything, what has happened, individuals are astutely aware that they need to invest in those things. So I wanted to present um, a model that I've seen to be successful. So, and it all starts with leadership. I'm hitting the arrow in the wrong direction, I apologize. So a leadership system is guidelines for how your leaders of the organization, formal and informal leaders act and behave on a regular basis. And it's about communicating, it's about decision-making, it's about alignment but mostly it's about thinking with the big picture mindset. And to do all those things, try to implement um, a system and structure that facilitates it so that you don't get variation in leadership, but you get consistency and that it's routine and easy and somewhat automatic. So that when you're facing uncertainty, the people aren't guessing how to act and behave, but they know how. And they have the skills and they have the processes and they have the tools to actually be effective, not just in an environment where we're facing a pandemic, but in any environment. So to me, what I've seen to be successful is this three-step approach is investing in new thinking, investing in new tools, that's your capabilities efforts. Systems and structures is the mentorship, the coaching, the processes that surround the person as they apply those new tools to solve problems and to move the organization forward towards its goals. And then execution is all about recording your lessons learned and tracking your results so that you can get better at getting better. I think this is an opportunity for us to look back and say, how did we react? Look at what we achieved and how do we go forward from here? What were the lessons learned that we had that allows us to become a better organization as a result of this challenge? Instead of, 
okay, we survived that challenge. Now let's go back to the way things were. I'm hopeful that organizations are thinking, how do we go forward from here? And the way that you go forward is through facilitating a feedback loop that allows you to collect information from all parts of your organizations, not just your internal operators, um, but from your patients, your patients' families, your suppliers, uh, all key stakeholders that rely on your organization for its important services. So what we're looking at here is probably something you've seen before, um, but it all starts with what's your organization's purpose. And, and then from that, you're, how do you translate that purpose into behaviors in the form of values and, and in a form of a culture? That you know, hopefully um, is your touchstone. And if during all this, you weren't regularly talking about who you are as an organization and trying to react to COVID-19 through your values, you need to, in the next communication you send out, find a way to touch on those things because that's what, that's bedrock, that's stability for your people. So if all you're talking about is change and uncertainty, you know, you can cause anxiety but if you can talk about what your values are and how they're gonna guide you during this situation, I think you give people a, a calmness to think logically about where they are and where they wanna go. And thinking about where you wanna go, that's, that's strategy. And sure, right now, strategy is pretty hard to form and really hard to articulate because so many things are moving so fast, but nonetheless, you have to try to paint a picture for where you wanna go. And, uh, communicate those things in a way to which people can understand um, where we're all going together. So if you're not trying to point specifically where you want to be in the future, everyone's going to make those things up for themselves and they're going to go in different directions. So we're seeing a lot of great improvement activity happen, but are those improvement activities competing with each other or pulling resources from one another or causing conflict? It's hard to know unless someone is trying to point all those things in the same direction. And that's the reason you set goals. And then from those goals, you turn it over into the actual problem solving uh, world, the realm, which is called the performance improvement system, which is where they take goals and they convert them into concrete action, execute either to improve a process, design a new process, whatever it might be, there's there needs to be a systematic approach to do those things. So talked a lot about communication and information sharing. Um, I think in times of uncertainty, communication tends to become one way. Um, you know, and, and I think early on when there is a need to have um, decisiveness and things done with uh, on a short timeline, that's okay. But as we move forward and those things are behind us, we have to open the communication channels back up so that it becomes two way again. And setting goals, communicating goals, designing plans to meet those goals, turning projects on to meet those goals, that's two way street. It's this constant communication between here's where we wanna to go to asking how do we get there or what did we learn along the way or what do we do next? And it's having those conversations with all parties involved, your patient, patient families, suppliers, and your operators. So if, if in this pandemic, you've only been kind of communicating in a one-way fashion, just try to find ways to change that conversation so that it becomes more two-way so that you're getting the feedback you need to um, validate where you pointed the direction for everyone to go is where everyone actually went. So trust but verify. So communication, I've, no change has ever occurred successfully without effective communication. And to me, the catch ball process is probably one of the best practices for communicating. So now that everyone knows where they're going, they have the ability to assess what are the things that are getting in our way to actually getting there. And they're going to be able to pinpoint and identify the barriers that exist 
And those barriers, those problem statements are actually opportunities to redesign process or create new process or innovate. And we're seeing a lot of people do a lot of really cool things, but there's probably a lot more really cool things that have happened that we haven't captured or a lot of things that people want to do that we just don't have enough time, energy, and resources to invest in right now, but we don't want those things to be lost. So asking the question, what ideas for improvement do you have? Finding a way to collect those ideas from your key stakeholders and documenting them to me is a great way to go forward is how do you capture those ideas? How do you put them in a, in a, a funnel or a repository so that you can review them and make decisions about them and then assign ownership to them, apply resources to them and actually go forward and execute on them. And there, there's a lot of ways to execute on a project. And sometimes I think we overcomplicate uh, problem solving if we can keep it simple so that anyone in the organization can do it, you'll have greater capacity to act on all the ideas. But if your highly trained process improvement team is the only ones who know how to do this, in some ways they're becoming the bottleneck because they're, at least for me, when I work, where I work, there was 16 of us to an organization of 18,000. That ratio is a little skewed. And if we were the only ones in the organization who know how to knew how to impact change or solve problems, you know, we were the bottleneck and we needed to find ways that everyone within the organization, even patients had the capacity to forward improvement ideas and act on them. So I think going forward, organizations can be asking themselves, should be asking themselves, how do we take this problem solving skill and make it available to everyone within our organization so that we can do more uh, with with that with that energy. So as ideas come forward, really what you're looking for is your low hanging fruit, those things that are easily implemented. There are some risk areas, you know, if, if you allow everyone to just get involved and try to participate in improvement and it's complex uh, or too sophisticated, you know, I would caution you not to do that. Try to triage your improvement ideas for complexity. And then those that are low hanging fruit, simple solutions, their, their local level um, work that kind of aligns with lean, trying to gain efficiency and reduce waste, that type of work, it, you should have everyone in your organization in a, a ready state to be able to act on projects like that. The more complex change I do, personally think that that needs to be handled by someone who has that training. Uh, but there's a lot of improvement activity that can happen in an organization without the improvement team ever being involved. So just the skill sets, most improvement teams are your master black belts and black belts. They're typically fully allocated. It's their full-time jobs to do projects. But within your organization, you can have white belts who know the vernacular, yellow belts who know waste, and green belts who are um, slightly more experienced and have a level of data savviness so that they can get involved too. So the green belt typically carves out about 25% of their time to be involved in the organization's problem solving activities. So if after COVID-19 you, you build this bundle and you identify great ideas and new ways to take your organization forward and you're lacking the capacity to actually uh, execute on those ideas, I'd strongly urge you to invest in these skills and to teach up what, what I call the extended office to allow everyone in the organization to participate in the improvement activities and to advance the organization. Because right now with COVID-19, I don't think we were very, um, we didn't concern ourselves with who was trying to make improvement because everyone was needing to pitch in. And I think that's a, a bright spot that we should go forward from here realizing that people can do some of these things for themselves and we need to give them the systems and structures so that they can do those things in a consistent fashion and be effective. And then we can track the results of those activities thereafter. So I'm gonna kind of jump to the end, the slides are available. Uh, some of those things that I hope individuals can take away from this presentation is to 
put a call out to the, your customers, your suppliers, your operators to ask for their input on what changes they made that they think should be spread across the organization or hardwired as a potential best practice to submit the project ideas that they had in their heads that they were never able to act on. And you can do that through paper ballot and submission boxes, so low tech. Uh, if you, um, you know, buy a cup of coffee for your intranet manager, ask them to build a form for you and make that available for everyone to kind of you know, complete at least the background of what the project idea is about. So you have enough information to say, yeah, that's something that we should be pursuing or that's something that's you know out of scope. From there, you're filtering these ideas. You wanna have an algorithm or some method to evaluate and prioritize these project ideas so that you can quickly identify your low hanging fruit, put those things on the track and start to execute them. That low hanging fruit, what that's gonna do is create capacity within your organization. So if a process took 30 minutes in a previous state and somewhere along the way, because of COVID-19, someone introduced a change to which that process now takes 10 minutes, but that is living in isolation and it's only happening in one part of your organization. If you spread that everywhere, that process was occurring, you can get 20 minutes back in that operator's day times how many operators are performing that process. What they can do with that 20 minutes is spend it towards additional improvement or possibly being more present with the patient that they have in front of them. So I think you can, those things add up. And the last thing is, as I'd said before, improvement's a team sport. So if you can get everyone involved with not just suggesting ideas, but actually acting on ideas, I think you'll see as we come out of COVID-19 um, that there's a new way forward. I think right now it's kind of hard to think long-term. There's probably groups and pockets of people who are there. We need to find a way to, to reach out to them and to get them to share those ideas so that we have record of them so that as this challenge subsides, we can move forward to something that hopefully allows us to be better prepared in the event another crisis occurs thereafter. So I'd hate to say it, this isn't the only challenge that health, healthcare is gonna face. And what I've read, this is, might be controversial, is with COVID-19 occurring, there's now a greater risk of people's mental health deteriorating. And bef even before COVID-19, there was major issue. We had a crisis on our hands in regards to the opioid pandemic. We're not hearing much about those things, but once the, the talk about COVID-19 dissipates, we're, those other things that were important before that we haven't been able to work on, they're gonna be a little bit further behind than they were before. And we gotta find ways to satisfy those things and, and go forward from here. So go ahead and conclude my presentation and turn off screen share and welcome any questions people might have. How do I do this? Yeah, Allie will just take it back. So um, any questions for Tom or Thomas? I don't know what you go by, sorry. Tom. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That was a really interesting point um, about all the projects that are gonna be behind as a result of this, that we're really in the forefront of the news and forefront of people we're talking about. Um, I wanna pause and let everybody have questions, but that really segues well into one of the discussion questions um, that we were asked this week. So I'm gonna pause for questions before I jump in, but it was a really great point. Looks like we can go ahead and get into the questions. Okay, so on that, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip to the second question that I have up on the screen because I think that segues um, into Tom's comment of, and these all came from someone asked Aaron and I these questions this week and I thought they were just really great and great discussion points. So the second question being, what are your thoughts on the media's portrayal of COVID-19. 
Uh, especially if you're in the front lines of seeing in the hospitals, working on a daily basis, doing these rapid improvement projects, talking to the frontline staff. I'm currently not. I'm sitting in my home in Charlotte. And so I would love to hear from you guys what you think the disconnects are, that they're really capturing it well um, from media versus frontline staff. I'm not afraid to call on people. <laughs> Jess, I see you. Valerie, I know you're on the call. Hey. So, um, in regards to how I'm feeling about the future. Um, currently in Cincinnati and Ohio, we're starting to open things back up um, and we have started opening back up our elective uh, procedures and everything within Ohio. So our hospital is really, you know, we were having very few patients. We've been pretty lucky here in Cincinnati. Um, so our hospital wasn't really overburdened and we're starting to ramp back up. So that's exciting. And, you know, there's obviously some level of anxiety, you know, like we don't know if there's going to be a second wave or if we're opening too soon. There's so many different models and um, it feels like none of the models say that we're ready, but here we are. So, you know, I think it's exciting and it's interesting to see, but it's also that there's just this large sense of ambiguity with, you know, QI work and the projects that we'll be doing in the next coming months, ramping back up. And then if there were to be a second wave, how are we going to manage and affect that, you know? And a lot of our learning academy stuff has become online and virtual. So we're not having any in-person trainings for QI throughout the end of the year. So everything will be virtual. And so learning how to teach QI to a team and actually run a project virtually is just, it's exciting, but it, you know, it's a little daunting to think about. Honestly, I don't know if anyone feels the same way. But yeah, I would love to hear what other people think too. Well, this is Belle, and so I guess just to your question about the media's portrayal, um, without getting myself into too much trouble, what I'll say is it's been interesting to see how at the hospital, we have a public information officer who takes our information and gives it to the media. And so there's a filter of what's being communicated to the public. Um, and, and I think that can swing both ways. I think in some ways, some things are communicated in a way that are much worse than what they actually are. And some things are communicated in a way that it's much better than what it actually is. So, um, I think what's challenging is knowing, you know, knowing that and the stories I hear about other locations, I don't know how much of it is really true. Yeah, you know, I just, I don't know. Um, you know, my sense is there are some things I think that are, are not communicated as well. Like I think our staff are scared and frustrated and um, yeah, and, and rightfully so. I mean, it's just, it's just exhausting the work that they're having to do. Um, and I just, I don't know that that gets, portrayed as much as some other things. Um, I think sometimes these shortages get trumped up a little more than what they really are, but um, it's, it's just hard to say. It's, you know, I, I guess I just come to appreciate that. I don't think that what gets said is as clear or as clean as it could be because, because there's a filter, right? We all have, you work for an institution, typically there's something you sign that says, I won't directly talk to the media. And if anyone calls, they're supposed to call this person over in, um, you know, community relations or whatever, public relations, whatever you call it. So, so I don't know, I, I guess just to be fair, I think that, you know, media has to sell materials. So they're going to, they're going to sell a story and we need to sell a story too. So yeah, it's, it's, it's probably about 50%, right? Like that's my take on it. And this is Cody and, and kind of going off what Val said there, I, I agree in a lot of ways. Um, I think at least here in Central Florida locally, we've seen, um, I would say the local media has done a really good job of giving my organization an opportunity to 
you know, reassure the public and tell them what's going on, what we're doing um, from an organizational perspective to address the pandemic and, and ensure public's health and, and have confidence that they can come to our facilities um, and seek care. Uh, nationally, I think, um, you know, kind of going off what Val said there, at least what I think Val was trying to say, you know, there's, there's some sensationalism for sure. I think, like she said, they have a product to sell. I think that they are, um, I think they're right, kind of, they're right on some things and not so right on others, but I, I do think there's a lot of politics in play. I think there's a lot of sensationalism in play. I think, um, you know, probably not everybody on this call agrees with, with things that have been done and haven't been done. And I think that's okay. I think we're all just, I mean, that's why we're doing this. We're trying to learn. We're trying to figure out, you know, if there is a second wave, what do we do? If there's another pandemic down the line, you know, did we overreact? Did we underreact? Um, and what was truly going to be the best way to move forward? That's, that's kind of what I take from all of this. So I think, um, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what else to say other than there's, um, there's definitely some division there. There's definitely, uh, this is obviously a sensitive topic, so I'm not going to share my, all of my personal opinions and beliefs because I don't think that's, that's value added for the group. But I do think that, uh, you know, I would, I would really like to see more focus on what hospitals and health systems and, and those of us who are treating these patients and who are seeing the real economic impact of this pandemic um, are going to move forward uh, because there has been a large impact to the, to the, not just how these patients are treated, but, you know, hospitals were more or less shut down for two months. And, you know, two, over almost 300 hospitals nationally have had furloughs or lost employees. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think any of us feel safe in our jobs right now. Those of us that work for health systems and those of you that work for mm -hmm. consulting firms are probably worried about having clients down the road. So it's um, Definitely. That's the reality that we're all facing. And, um, you know, I would like to see more coverage of that and more discussions about how we're going to fix that problem moving down the line. Um, so those are just some of my thoughts on it. So I'll kind of leave it at that and see what other people have to say. That's an interesting point, Cody. Um, this is Aaron, Connie. Um, I've heard of some health systems, even some that we work with, uh, that their process improvement management engineering departments were furloughed and some of them almost completely dissolved, you know, as a result of this. So it's like, it's even more important at this point that we kind of justify our worth uh, to the organization, exactly. you know, so um, really good point. Um, do you have anything uh, else, Allie? Oh, we got like two minutes left here. Hi, Aaron. This is Jim Benyon. I have a, hey, I have a couple of very quick comments on bullet three, I guess. Um, so first, uh, sad to hear that there'll only be one more. This has been really fantastic and kudos to you two and every everybody else. Um, I think what's been demonstrated on, on this, this um, weekly series is the ability for IE to happen quickly, right? And in the moment and respond and not do, you know, nine month long projects, um, but, but really try to meet the need in the moment. So that, that's been really awesome. I, I agree that the work now needs to start to take a focus of how do we balance, you know, the economics and, and keeping the work and people's employment and people's safety moving in parallel uh, as we have to manage, you know, the plateau or the resurgence as it comes and goes of the epidemic as, as evidenced by second waves already having started. I mean, this work is going to be important. Um, but the third thing is a meta challenge, I think, to this group. And I saw, I thought I saw James Ro uh, Rawson on the call earlier, but this is something he has an interest in also, right? Like promoting the value and visibility of industrial engineering to really add value to healthcare. And the board of directors, you know, I, I used to be very active in SHS, for 20, 25 years has been having this recurring discussion of how come people don't really appreciate the full utility of what folks like you and us can do and how could we demonstrate that? And so here's this really sentinel event, this tragedy. Um, how do we, is there any opportunity to make the value of industrial engineering more, more visible and more appreciated to the healthcare community would be a really good thinking exercise. Those are my comments, sorry. Oh, great points. Yeah. 
Maybe, um, you know, I'm glad to hear you found these valuable, uh, Dr. Benyon. Um, it's been really good to to do these. Um, and, you know, these are not, inspiring. <laughs> so, you know, everyone's work really is. So what what I think maybe we could do, we'll, Allie and I will talk, but maybe there's a discussion one after this about what you just said. And maybe we could, um, you know, maybe pull you in and partner with you a little bit on that going, you know, what how we would frame that discussion so we could have a lot of good conversation. Because I think that would draw a lot of people in, um, right. especially with where we're at. Right. Happy to. Okay. Great. Okay. I think that's good for today. I'll, I'll, I was recording. I'll stop it and share it. Like Ali said, and, um, we'll talk, we'll be on again in two weeks. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thanks guys.